Well, hello there and welcome to Mind Your Business. I'm Jennifer Anderson, Executive Director of the Georgina Chamber of Commerce and also host of the show. Welcome to season three. We are thrilled to be back here for another season on Rogers TV Georgina. Over the course of the first two seasons, we really focused the show on two different areas. We uh, first of all provided information to businesses. So we really discussed the issues that matter most to the businesses within the town of Georgina. Uh, talked about programs, talked about opportunities and resources that existed for these businesses. We also brought in stakeholders and politicians from all levels of government to be able to discuss the grants and resources that were available to these businesses. On the other hand, we talked about business. So we really highlighted different businesses that are in the town of Georgina. And we focused on the importance of shopping local, especially during this time. So we will, in season three, continue to really focus on these two areas. But fingers crossed, we also want to add more reopening and recovery and that information into the mix as we, as we discuss all of the topics for business and about business in Georgina. So, of course, as we head into season three, we will discuss all of these issues about business, but we're adding different element in right now. The election is just days away, the federal election. So who better to bring on our first show in season three to talk about the election platforms, adver advocacy, uh, government relations than the folks at the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. With a network of 450 chamber members and over 200,000 businesses represented, the Canadian Chamber of Commerce helps the businesses that support our families, our community, and our country. And I have three folks who are joining me as guests today. Let me introduce them to you now. Mark Agnew is the Senior Vice President of Policy and Government Relations. Thanks for joining us on the show today, Mark. Thanks for having me on, Jennifer. Glad to be here for the kickoff of season three. Yay, season three. <laughs> I'm thrilled to have you here. Uh, we also have Ala Dregler Burke. She is the Director of Small to Medium Enterprise and Parliamentary Affairs. Hi, Ala. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you for being here. And last but not least, we have Harrison Roos, and he is the Director of Campaigns. Thanks, Harrison, for joining us on the show. Thanks very much for uh, having us on here this morning. Well, I'm thrilled to have all of you on here as we begin a discussion. And, you know, we were joking off uh, camera just about our small little chamber here. I know there's chambers right across the country who are of all different sizes, 450 chamber members uh, that, that uh, the CCC represents. So, Mark, I'm going to start with you. Tell me a little bit about the Canadian Chamber of Commerce and what they provide to chambers across the country. Yeah, well, th thanks, Jennifer, for having us on. And um, so, I mean, as much as we do talk about um, the, you know, over 400 chambers of commerce across the country, you know, that are members, um, you know, that is really just the tip of the iceberg. So if I look at the membership composition of the Canadian Chamber, we have those over 400 chambers, which, as you said, everything from the, you know, Toronto Boards of Trade or, or through on down to the, you know, volunteer run, you know, chambers. Um, we also have in the Canadian Chamber's membership direct company members which again, everything from the large multinational household names that you'll know through the single shingle consultants. And then we also have sector associations in our membership. And so when you combine all three of those together, it really does make the Canadian Chamber quite genuinely the largest business association in the country. And being able to speak on behalf of businesses of all sizes and in all sectors is really the sort of, you know, narrative that we tell policymakers in Ottawa for why what we're advocating to them is in the best interest of you know Canada and the Canadian business community, and as much as we provide uh, services to our members, you know some people might know things like a, a Carnet certificate or a you know certificate of origin that has to be certified. Really, you know, for Harrison, Allen, and I, you know, the bread and butter that we deliver is the advocacy and the government relations work at both the federal and international levels. And the way that we go about developing that, I mean, Jennifer, you'll know, we have the AGM process where chambers across the country get together. We have a vigorous debate about, you know, the big policy issues of the day, and we take those forward and we advocate for them. And then we also have our policy committees that we engage members in, in the policy development process. So all told, it can be a little bit messy at times, but I think when you're an organization of our size, you know, you never are going to have those tensions you have to sort through, but I think it does make the advocacy that much more effective when we're out talking to policymakers and government. 
Well, and, and certainly for me, and I hope this comes out right, as a smaller chamber, we don't often have the resources or the ability to look at the issues, the policy um, on a federal level. And so to be able to almost have an extension of our office uh, as the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, it really does help our community. It helps our businesses uh, to really feel like they're represented and feel like they're part of that policy process and making a difference in the changes that are coming about. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, we talk in times, we'll use the phrase, you know, what, what's the toolkit that we're going to send down to the local chambers, but, you know, a toolkit is a really fancy way of saying, what is that we're going to give you as the local chambers to best equip you to be an advocate in your community? And it's important to have that voice and those boots on the ground presence for, you know, whether, again, you're the volunteer run chamber or whether you have a staff of six, um, you have local connections to your members of parliament, members of provincial parliament, and other stakeholder groups um, that are there in your communities and having that extra voice really does complement the work that we do here directly in Ottawa. Um, what I would say too about the local chambers is that um, they also provide a great source of intelligence for us at the national level. Um, they provide us that connectivity and the information that we need to, you know, um, go to policymakers with real, you know, stories uh, on the ground as to how there are economic issues that are affecting companies in the real world. And the last thing I'll just say is we have a team of experts um, you know, here in Ottawa who are able to, you know, work on different policy files to speak to folks in government. Um, you know, we have Ala, who's our expert on SME issues. Uh, you know, Harrison comes from the communications background. He's able to take a lot of the work that we're doing and make it relevant from like a, a media standpoint, which is another key vehicle for us to influence uh, decisions that are being made by government. Right. So as... Um you know, as a business and, and one of the members that exist, is is that really the priority for you um, as a Canadian chamber to really look at those policies? And because I know, and you discussed right off the top, that there are a lot of different um, opportunities and things that exist with the Canadian chamber, but really it is the advocacy that you're focusing on. Yeah, and we do have other parts of the chamber that work on, you know, business services. And I you know, mentioned a moment ago, the, you know, the carnets for people that are bringing a good abroad temporarily or getting a document certified. But certainly for my team, our bread and butter work is that policy and advocacy. And having that connectivity is critical because, I mean, as much as I like to think that a government policymaker would like to hear what I think about a given issue, we're only credible to the extent that we have seen to be representing the members that we claim to speak on behalf of. Right. So as a policy and government relations guy, <laughs> when you get the news that there is an election coming, <laughs> are you excited about that? Are you thrilled about that for businesses um, during this time? It's a mixed bag. So there are some things where I think it's a great opportunity with a new government coming in, whether it's a, you know, a, a new political party or whether it's a reelected government to put issues, you know, on the agenda. Um, but admittedly, it does come with some frustration. There are things that were being discussed in the last parliament and certain legislation that was being considered. Um, and in our parliamentary system, as you know, some of your viewers might know, once an election is called uh, the so-called sort of parliamentary order paper, but essentially the, the agenda gets wiped clean and every bill gets uh, uh, you know, scrub that wasn't already passed. And so there certainly were initiatives. Um, I'm thinking one that we were really pushing for around forms to how businesses have to handle the privacy and information that their consumers give them. We were hoping to see some reforms and modernizations. That one didn't happen. Not very happy to see it go back to scratch. But again, it's a bit of a mixed bag with being able to put some new opportunities out there in the window. Right. The Canadian Chamber of Commerce does have an election policy platform. Um, tell me a little bit about that. So really, um, we've spent the last, you know, 18 plus months talking about, you know, recovery and just hobbling kind of day to day in the pandemic. Um, and we'd be selling ourselves short as a country if we were solely seeking to just recover back to where we were. Um, what we actually think is important is having a plan to actually address the, you know, real economic challenges that we face as a country. And what is it going to take to get us to actually grow the economy to being in a better spot to where we were before the pandemic? The platform, which we can talk about, you know, a bit more over the course of uh, the conversation has lots of different recommendations in it, but really there's three headline items. One is making sure that we first finish the fight against COVID, supporting those hardest hit sectors um, that need to get through to the other end and not sort of cutting the life buoy 10 feet away from shore. 
The second thing is addressing those, you know, fundamental economic issues um, that afflicted us before the pandemic and that unfortunately are still with us around the regulatory burden on businesses, having infrastructure available so that companies can move goods to their customers abroad. And then the third piece is around getting ready for the 21st century opportunities. And, you know, I, I recognize that we're a fifth of the way through, uh, actually a bit more than a fifth of the way through the century, but um, we're still lagging behind in a lot of key areas, whether it's, you know, the environment, the mining sector and agriculture, and there's massive opportunities for Canada, but we need to do the work now to be able to seize on those. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mark, hold that thought. I'm going to bring Harrison in. I just want to ask, because you did mention that um, what it takes to grow, that is a, a campaign that was just released to um, all of the chambers um, specifically, uh, but want to ask Harrison a little bit about just the overall campaigns. This is something that you work on in your position, Harrison. Yeah, so how the Canadian Chamber of Commerce has been approaching campaigns over the last year and a half or so has been to put a greater emphasis on the public side of the advocacy work. And so that's the, the part of the role, the part of the picture that I fill in. And so it's sort of taking the, the work that Mark and Alan and a number of our other colleagues are doing uh, and translating it into messages and material that help reinforce the government relations activities, but in the public sphere uh, to try to uh, drive decision makers to uh, understand the realities and the rationale for uh, what Mark and Alan and others are telling them. Right. This is, and I found on the website, um, there was just one, one sentence that stuck out to me when I was reading about the different campaigns. And it was the idea of um, that these, um, I'm just looking for it here. It was the idea that, you know, you're taking kind of the grassroots level and you're, you're developing these policy and you're developing these campaigns based off of what you're hearing right across the country. So is that kind of the standard with all of the campaigns that you're working on? Yeah, with campaigns, it's, it's very much a two-way street. A uh, campaign has to, of course, serve the purpose on, on the advocacy front that I just mentioned, but for it to be relevant and useful for chambers and boards of trade across the country, uh, they have to be engaged with the work and, and giving us that intelligence and information on the ground of, of what the real life implications are of what's happening in Ottawa. But then conversely, we need to make sure that we're providing um, people like you with the material that helps you to put those campaigns to use at the local level because you know every member of parliament in Ottawa, of course, has a home uh, somewhere across the country. And so it's very important to have those relationships as well. And, and I mean, fundamentally, it does all come back to relationships. It's working together to achieve a common purpose and, and working across multiple fronts to try to get there. It's not enough to just have, you know, a meeting on a golf course. That's an important part, but it's also, uh, you know, what's happening in social media, what's happening in the local media, the press, um, and then what's happening, of course, in the, the halls of parliament as well. Right. Um, and and I would imagine, too, it's it's this difficult balance, because as we're desperately trying to get out of COVID and we're trying to move forward, um, it, you know, we're also creating the future opportunities when we hope that it is a thing of the past. So it really is that balance in those three key points. Yes, exactly. And I mean, the, the challenge we're with right now is that, that COVID is sort of turning from something where there's a, a, a clear starting point and a clear end point to something where the, the end point may actually be uh, very prolonged. And so it's, you know, addressing the immediate fight and crisis, but then still also turning our attention back to those fundamentals that, that Mark mentioned, because I mean, the reality for Canada economically is that uh, we have to have a, a higher goal than to just going back to where we were before COVID because mm -hmm. where we were pre COVID wasn't, uh, necessarily exactly where we want to be. Canada wasn't leading in growth. Uh, we weren't the most competitive places, place in terms of regulations or taxation. And so we actually do have to, to get our fundamentals right. Uh, and it's not just a matter of getting back to where we were before COVID. And, and then we can start to look to the future once that foundation is in place to build. Um, another campaign that is taking place right now is the business-led campaign. What is, what is this campaign? The business-led recovery campaign is our overarching effort that is working with the business community and really holding up the business community as the solution to a lot of the challenges that our country is facing as a result of the pandemic. And it essentially stems from a fundamental core belief that economic growth, for it to be real economic growth, has to be led by the private sector. And so we're working with members of the business community 
chambers of commerce and of course our corporate members as well to really showcase the work that businesses are doing to get Canada through this crisis, but then also providing tools and resources to help more businesses uh, recover from the pandemic. So whether it's um, toolkits about how to encourage employees to get vaccinated or reopening guides to maintain safety and cleanliness in facilities uh, to, of course, the policy side as well that, of course, Mark and Alan can speak to uh, in great detail. It, it's really to, to bring everything together to help the private sector get through the crisis um, and, and also to showcase the leadership of the business community in this process. Is it safe to say that your multitasking skills are impeccable? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there's there's usually more than one ball in the air, it feels like. Well, and, you know, we're just focusing on two campaigns. I know that there are several campaigns that uh, are currently in play and that exist. And so it really is a matter of, I assume, not just multitasking, but also really um, tapping into uh, different levels, different situations, and really making sure that you have a pulse of what's going on right across the country. Yeah, so the two that we've talked about with what it takes to grow and the business-led recovery are, are the two sort of broad overarching uh, initiatives that we have right now. And there's about half a dozen other uh, initiatives that are more focused on specific sectors or specific groups of companies. So for example, one that we just launched uh, about a month ago is Cyber Right Now. And that's a particularly timely issue uh, as it focuses on cybersecurity, which is a, an issue, of course, with more and more people working remotely. Uh, how that how cybersecurity works for businesses and chambers of commerce changes when you have to secure a whole bunch of networks all over the place instead of just one in your physical location. Um, we have other initiatives around agriculture, around tax, around trade. Um, there's, so it, it, it's, it's certainly a, a full plate, but they're all very important initiatives. And I'll mention as well, through things like business-led recovery and what it takes to grow, it also provides an opportunity to bring those pieces that are separate, to bring them back together as well and to present them to decision makers as complementary to each other. And, and it helps to reinforce why these various pieces are important to one another. Perfect. Thank you, Harrison. I uh, want to ask Ella a couple of questions. Um, first of all, Ella, as the Director of SME and Parliamentary Affairs, tell me a little bit about your role at the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. Yeah, absolutely. So my role focuses really on supporting small and medium-sized businesses. Uh, the last 18 months would have been primarily focused on helping them survive and recover through the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but I also work with um, my colleagues, Mark, and, and our other policy directors, in our parliamentary affairs advocacy activities. So whether that's, you know, looking forward uh, to planning a Parliament Hill advocacy day, to developing government, government relations strategies, to helping coordinate our committee appearances and whatnot, um, that's kind of all encompassing in my role. Uh, so for me, it, it kind of goes hand in hand too, because, you know, 98% of businesses in Canada are small businesses. So that really touches on uh, almost every single portfolio and of commerce so i work very closely with all of our colleagues in the various areas where um, our two um, areas intersect so if a small business is in the natural resources sector or you know they're operating uh, as a tech company um, i will work with different directors to uh, make sure that small businesses are represented in, in the advocacy work that they're doing on their respective files is it difficult to navigate the work that you're doing because not only are you dealing with geographically different businesses in different provinces, but you're also do, dealing with um, different size businesses. It does get challenging, but I think the beauty of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce is that we are a, a network and we have our local chambers and our provincial and territorial chambers. who are able to, um, you know, focus in on the regional niche issues and the chamber is able to come in and, and you know, really string those together into the national perspective and advance some of the national issues that affect chambers of all shapes and sizes, or, you know, chambers that, you know, if there's a rural chamber um, from various provinces, uh, what issues are common amongst them and how do we advance, um, you know, those forward and make sure that we're, that we're making it easier and, and for them to do business versus urban centers. Um, and, and I think that there's a lot of commonalities amongst businesses um, from across Canada, we are a very, you know, large geographic country. Um, and while there are differences uh, within regions, I think a lot of the times the, the issues that businesses face are, are, are common amongst, you know, whether you're a small business in Newfoundland versus a small business in Alberta. Um, and I think COVID really helped 
uh, amplify that that commonality. And I think what we're trying to do is ensure that there's a, a standard of, of um, opportunity for, for businesses, whether you're a small business of five or a larger business of, you know, 250 employees. Well, and I, I have certainly seen uh, the advantages not only to just policy and, and the creation of policy at the AGM and the conferences that take place, but that collaboration with uh, other chambers. And so when you're there and you're talking to other chambers and you typically kind of gravitate towards similar size chambers to yourself, but it really is an opportunity to understand that that uh, we're not so different. <laughs> no matter where we are, it's, it really is, um, you know, what's affecting business in one place is typically affecting it somewhere else. Absolutely. And I think the, the other avenues of participation within the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, such as our policy committees, um, really give smaller chambers that opportunity to come to the table and have that dialogue and hear from other chambers of, you know, larger chambers or from other areas, um, as well as businesses that may be from other areas and are not a member of yours and, and, you know, coming together and having those concrete solutions that we can then take forward to government is something that I think is a really, really big asset of, of being a member of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce for, for a chamber of any size. One of the yeah. great things, Jennifer, I can just add there, I think one of the great things that you know, as, as much as COVID has been very challenging, one of the great things that has happened as a result of it is really this coming together of the business community and, and realizing on a lot of these fundamental issues that Al is talking about, we really are all in this together. And that's something that carried the Canadian Chamber through, uh, you know, most of 2020 is this, this mantra really again and again, we are all in this together. And so knowledge and information that one business has and learns and uh, equally, you know, insights from one chamber, uh, Truthfully, a lot of what, what I was spending my time doing in 2020 was just working on moving all that information around from one organization to another so that other people can benefit from the things that everybody's been learning over the past year and a half. It, it's a really crucial part of, of the work that we've been doing. I agree with that. And, I, you know, for us, it everybody talks about shop local and the idea of shopping local, and it really is kind of a buzzword, but over the last 18 months, it has become a way of life. And I think that, you know, we're all in this together could be that cliche buzzword, except now you're right. It really has become a standard by which we really have to, to trust and to know that, you know, together we're making a difference and together we're able to build and recover and, and get through this. Um, that was one of the questions that I had for you. It was the idea of, you know, as a small business, as a chamber, we really have had to pivot. Um, and everybody loves <laughs> the word pivot. It's, um, the word, it's the word of the pandemic. <laughs> Yes. So, and of course, I had to add it into the show. Um, but how has the Canadian Chamber of Commerce had to have had to pivot through this whole pandemic? Um, Mark, let's start with you. Um, I mean, the, the most obvious thing, but I think it does worth uh, sort of uh, you know stating is around the switch to virtual activities. And um, I think there was all the logistical hurdles that you know we've all dealt with, and we've all used about eighteen different uh, you know video conferencing uh, applications. But um, one of the things that it has done is that it's increased um, the ability of our members across the country to participate in our activities. Um, Frankly, before the pandemic, we were a very in-person event-based organization, which we got a lot of value from, members loved it, but it also made it hard for people to work within their travel budgets to be able to say, well, you know, am I going to fly from Toronto to Calgary for a one-day meeting, or am I going to actually, you know, fly from, uh, you know, Keswick, drive down to Toronto, and then fly from Toronto to Calgary? That's a difficult proposition. It's so much easier now with this, you know, international connectivity, sorry, um, with the sort of uh, sorry national connectivity, what I meant to also say was internationally, it's helped the Canadian Chamber a lot too. Where um, you know businesses are able to plug into overseas trade missions. There's been a lot of international events where, again, someone coming from you know Keswick trying to go and do a trade mission, they can't justify the the expenses for their small business to fly out to you know some far flung place to go meet with some clients or potential clients more correctly. Uh, Zoom has become a huge, huge help to breaking down those costs and accessibility barriers to help uh, companies. 
Absolutely. Um, and this is a great question for you too, Ella, because you are um, really hands-on with these small and medium-sized businesses right across the country. Absolutely. And I think one of, one of the, the best things, as you know, as what Mark was saying, is, is the virtual aspect where um, when it comes to parliamentary affairs and advocacy, uh, we are able to allow more small businesses to connect with MPs, not just within their own region, but also, you know, across the province or across the country. Um, and for us to be able to hear more from um, businesses that may not have been members of the chamber before, but are able to participate in our conferences or what have you. Uh, and then that, you know, leading to collaboration from there is, is, is critical. Very good. And as we move kind of forward, um, and especially, you know, with a federal election in just uh, a couple of weeks, a few short days, um, are we doing enough? Is enough being done for uh, local businesses to be able to uh, get through this, to recover and to start reopening safely um, in this country? Harrison? Um, uh, no, Mark, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, you know, we, we've seen the sort of uh, the, the, the seeds of some things that will get us to the other end, whether it's extending some of the support programs for the travel, tourism, and hospitality sectors, um, whether it's helping, you know, provinces and by extension businesses and consumers navigate through the uh, the sort of morass that is vaccine passports and credentials, um, you know, at the moment, um, you know, helping improve things like ventilation, you know, uh, systems and businesses. I mean, these are all things that we're seeing, you know, being talked about in varying ways. The thing is, we need to see execution, and it's not like execution after a six-month review with endless amounts of you know hearings into it. Like we need execution like now, and so I think whoever wins the election on September twentieth, our message to them is like on September you know twenty-first or you know sometime very shortly thereafter, get on with implementing the plan because we don't have the luxury of sitting around and talking about it for the next six months. Right, and it's certainly you know for for the Canadian Chamber, it's not an end on September 20th. It's just another beginning, another campaign to make sure that, um, you know, politicians are listening, that um, really the businesses right across the country are being listened to and uh, being helped to get through this. Yeah, that's that would be sort of my thought in terms of how, you know, fundamentally we're approaching the election is that, well, of course, we want the political parties to be talking about the issues that are important to our communities and, and business community, but uh, it, it's really laying the groundwork for for what happens, um, you know, and after those, you know, couple weeks after the election day, while there's the, the transition to whoever the new government is, I, it's really laying the groundwork for those people to get to work and have at the, you know, the top of their, uh, their worksheets of the issues that are important to business and really getting the fundamentals right to get Canada back on track and, and back open and everybody enjoying their communities once again. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of you. And thanks to everyone at home for watching. We'll see you next time.